Welcome, everybody. My name is Jess Posner. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the director of the Virtual Y at the YMCA of Central New York. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's edition of our September Virtual Y speaker series, Healthy Aging. Tonight's guest, who is our final guest of the month, is Samantha Aguam, Deputy Director of Volunteer Lawyers Project of CNY, Inc., I'm very excited to learn tonight from Sam, and I hope that you'll find her session tonight useful and informative. She has provided me with her slide deck tonight, so after the presentation, I will email that out to anybody that was registered for tonight's event um, after we all log off. So you'll have that for your resources, and it is packed with information. But before we begin, I'd like to welcome you and offer a few announcements. Though we are coming to you virtually and accessible to anyone in the world with access to the internet, the YMCA of Central New York does exist as eight locations and three camps located in and around Onondaga County in New York State, which stands upon the unceded, occupied, traditional ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples. As your host, I'd like to offer a visual description of myself. I am a tall, larger-bodied, queer white woman of mixed European and Jewish heritage who lives with chronic illness. I am wearing a gray turtleneck, some funky earrings and um, overalls actually, they're kind of cute. Um, and I have kind of a funky haircut and red lipsticks. Um, the background behind me looks like a library. There's also some plants um, and the sun is setting. So we're losing a little natural light but it's being replaced with um, artificial. Here at the Y, um, we are so happy to celebrate Healthy Aging Month. Um, and this month, our virtual speaker series featured three free educational seminars focusing on different aspects of healthy aging. Those included financial, brain health, and the law. Here at the Y, we are happy to partner with experts who provided helpful resources on navigating these issues, whether you're navigating them on your own or helping out a loved one. If you miss any of those presentations, we are recording them and we'll be uploading them to our YouTube channel and the Virtual Y website within the coming weeks. We'll send out those links to anyone that registered for our events, as well as via the monthly Y newsletters. Please be sure to keep an eye out for these. Any publicly shared version of these videos will only include the visual feed of myself and our featured speaker tonight. And finally, I'd like to share that we will be hosting a variety of events focused on breast cancer awareness in October, which is coming just a few days away, both in person and also virtually. We'll be posting the full schedule of events to social media and on the Y main webpage. If you'd like to have those events emailed directly to you, you can email me at virtual at ymcacny.org and I'll be happy to send that over to you. Our first program will be on Wednesday, next Wednesday, from 5 to 6 p.m. with representatives from the American Cancer Society. So that'll be Wednesday, October 6th. Now, um, we welcome our guest tonight, Samantha A. Aguam Esquire. Sam Aguam is the Deputy Director of the Volunteer Lawyers Project of CNY. And I'm going to spotlight her so that we can see her. All right. Here we go. So Sam is the Deputy Director of Volunteer Lawyers Project of Central New York, Inc. VLP provides pro bono legal services for low-income individuals in Central New York. Sam primarily works with VLP's elder law and disability programs and is originally from the Central New York area. She graduated from the State University of New York at Albany with a degree in business administration, concentrating in management and marketing. She then earned her Juris Doctorate from University of Detroit Mercy School of Law, Detroit, Michigan. After graduating from law school, Sam returned to Central New York. Prior to her admission to the New York Bar, she began volunteering with VLP's eviction defense program. Soon after, she joined VLP staff as a pro bono coordinator. Once she was admitted to practice law in New York, Sam became a staff attorney and eventually a deputy director with VLP. She is a member of the New York Bar Association, Onondaga Bar Association, the Central New York Women's Bar Association, and serves on the board of CNY Fair Housing as vice president. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the virtual stage to our very accomplished and impressive guest, Samantha Aguam. 
Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you everybody for having me. Uh, just to give you an idea for those of you who can't see me, I am a middle-aged 30-something uh, year old uh, and uh, dark hair, really pretty boring compared to Jess here. I've got a gray coat on, dark clothes and some drapes behind me. So typical lawyer, so nothing too exciting. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into it. As Jess said, there's a PowerPoint that I'm gonna be going through with this. I think, you know, for this sort of information, it's a lot and don't feel like uh, you have to rush to take a lot of notes. I tried to put a good amount in the PowerPoint that way you have it to refer back to. And um, if you have any questions after that, at the end of this PowerPoint, I've got my information. You're always welcome to reach out to me by email or phone um, if I could be of any assistance. I totally welcome that as well. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with that PowerPoint I'm talking about. And just give me one moment. Okay, so just to start off with a little bit of what lawyers always want to talk about today, I'm starting with uh, what we're talking about today is legal information. So legal information is like the who, what, when, where, how, like where can I find this information? What's out there? I don't need details about what's going on in your situation to give you this information, right? Versus legal advice, which is based on advice and course of action I would recommend. Uh, it's subjective to details about your case. So anything we talk about today, uh, great for you to know about, know that they're available, and things that you should talk to an attorney more about if needed. Some things I'm going to talk about I just wanted to let you know about and are a little bit more to talk to your medical professionals about, and some of them are more to talk about an attorney with your specific situations. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what's out there in the elder law field that you want to be thinking about, that all of us should be really thinking about. Then that includes really four documents I'm gonna to talk to you guys at length a little bit about. And I'm sure you probably have heard these, powers of attorney, healthcare proxy, living will, and last will and testament. These are all kind of key documents to what we call life planning. So what's a power of attorney? So a power of attorney is a very powerful legal document. It's basically so that another person can manage your financial affairs uh, and, uh, and your decision-making on your behalf. Uh, a power of attorney here in New York State, uh, we have a durable power of attorney that I'll define a little bit more for you. But basically it means that, you know, even beyond an event of a, a disability or an illness, your power of attorney can grant somebody else the power to help you do things like this. Um, and I'm going to go into detail about what I mean by that. So just to start off with some definitions. So for a uh, power of attorney, we have a thing called a principal. So that's the person, probably yourself, that's gonna execute a power of attorney. And this power of attorney is gonna grant an agent authority to act on his or her behalf. Uh, the agent is the person who has that authority to do such things. The agent works in, under the instruction of this power of attorney document that's created. And unless there's an explicit uh, instruction in it, they're always supposed to act on the principal's best interest, always. So for New York, as I mentioned, durable power of attorney. So if someone were to become temporarily or permanently incapacitated, they could use this power of attorney. And in here, I have an example, typical that you hear, right? Uh, sadly, somebody's in a car accident. You're unconscious for a period of time, but bank account still needs to be managed. Rent still needs to be paid. Bills, utilities, right? So who can manage that? Who do I feel comfortable granting as my agent to help do this if I'm not able to? So really important to think about and consider in your planning if you don't already have one. So with the power of attorney, when does it go into effect? You have the principal uh, size of power of attorney and has it notarized, it's called an acknowledgement. And uh, it's effective as soon as the agent signs it. So just because you write one out, uh, your named agent or agents need to sign as well. So you if you have two or more agents that are designated to act together, so I've got two adult children, I want my son and my daughter to both act on my behalf together, make decisions for me under the power attorney, do this for me. Uh, if you do that, then they both have to sign it in front of a notary and have it acknowledged. Uh, they don't have to sign at the same time though, and they don't have to sign at the same time as you. So it's a little bit more flexible than what you might have heard of in a will where everybody's got to sign at the same time. And we'll go over that. Um, so 
optional. And also in your uh, power of attorney, you could also have the other option where this is not required, where you could have a agent named and then if something were to happen to them, a successor agent where, you know, you've named one child, but they're not available. They're overseas or something. They're not reachable. So then I say my other child can act as the alternate. In that case, everybody doesn't have to stay aside at the same time to make it uh, uh, enforceable. So how long does a power of attorney remain in effect? So like I was saying, a principal may revoke a, or terminate a power of attorney anytime for any reason. So as long as you have capacity, uh, a sound of mind, then you can uh, remove the person. You would send a letter and uh, notify anybody as a power of attorney, make a new power of attorney, things like that. Um, but uh, if you don't have sound mind, that it has to be removed by the court. So if you were to say, if you were to be develop dementia or develop capacity issues, then you're no longer able to terminate that power of attorney and court action has to be taken. Hopefully that makes sense. So you're no longer of sound mind to do so. So it's very important that you really trust whoever you're naming the agent, that if something were to happen to me, I'm okay with them doing this, right? Having these decision-making powers. Uh, so. What am I talking about with these decision-making powers, right? With a power of attorney, it could be broad legal authority or it could be more narrow. So it could be uh, very narrow to there's a house closing and I, and, you know, I have mobility issues. I'm not able to make it. I want my son to go out there, do the transactions. I specifically say that in my power of attorney and that's it. Or it could just be very broad. I want that to, if need be, manage everything, manage my banking, manage any business transactions I have. So very large. And right, and you could also have it very specifically done. There's a big modification section that's totally, uh, you're able to kind of modify that as you'd like and what you want to put in there. So that's a good one. That's a good thing to keep in mind as well. Uh, so you know, you're like, okay, I had to come up with all these things. No, like all the things that you want to have an agent do, New York law actually lists out the powers that you want to think about in your power of attorney. So there's a lot of really common ones. And you can give, again, you could do a check. You could sign your initials next to each of these, none of these, some of these, anything, you know, it's up to you. Uh, you could also even give the agent you name the De power to delegate anything in that, you know, anything, the duties that they have to somebody else. So uh, it could be a really powerful document. Here's that list I'm talking about. So as you can see, lots of different things here, but lots of things that are really important. As I said, like the real estate transactions, but also, you know, benefits, talking about financial uh, matters regarding your health care in the hospital, you need to talk to insurance companies, right? Uh, Medicaid, Social Security, uh, taxes are due when you're incapacitated. What am I going to do? Who's going to handle that for me? These are the sort of things you can grant to your agent under the power of attorney. So really key stuff to just basically keep life floating, life going when you're not able to do it on your own behalf, right? So there actually has been some updates as of recently. As of June 13th of this year, there has been some new uh, big changes in the power of attorney. And uh, basically, and the power attorney has to be acknowledged by, has to be acknowledged as witness or uh, notarized and now has to be witnessed. So that's new. Uh, so now it has to be witnessed by two people. The good thing is that it has to be acknowledged, it has to be notarized and that notary can also be one of the witnesses. So uh, it's just as long as the other witness, the other witness can be, let's say somebody at the bank. A lot of times uh, notaries are done at the bank. So but all banks have notaries. So if you're wondering, where do I go? Go to a bank. A lot of other places do too, courthouses, law libraries, lots of other places. Uh, lots of other people have uh, notaries, uh, but usually the bank, you can have you know, the notary and they can act also as one of the witnesses. And then you need somebody else, maybe somebody else at the bank, maybe you bring along your friend or somebody or a loved one who's not named in the power of attorney uh, to help acknowledge that power of attorney. Um, even if you already have one and you already had, uh, uh, well, you know, it's already uh, enforceable power of attorney prior to June 13th this year, it's still enforceable today. So you don't have to, you could create a new one that might be good just to update it, but it's still enforceable. So that's not a problem. 
One of the things I kind of touched on with the health things that I think is really important, an agent it will be considered your personal representative for purposes of healthcare financial matters. So healthcare providers, your doctors, your hospitals, um, the health plans, all that must provide the agent with information, their agent needed to determine the legitimacy of the services need to, and the accuracy of the charges. So that's really important, right? That you want, uh, you know, your loved one, your son or daughter, your spouse, whoever it is to be able to look at the finances and be provided that information to make sure you're being charged correctly, right? And to make sure that it's legitimate. Um, you know, and that's a, a very big important thing. And sometimes people think that kind of falls under the healthcare proxy, but it's really the power of attorney in financial matters. Um, the power of attorney, this has always been true, has always needed to be signed initially and dated by the uh, principal with capacity. So I just wanted to point out capacity. Uh, you know, I don't create this information, right? This is from the National Center of Elder Rights and uh, the ABA Commission on Aging is great. And basically they say the standard for uh, power of attorney to have capacity is basically you have capacity to sign a contract. So attorneys should and advocates take it as that a presumption that somebody has capacity, right? Uh, you know, their ability to make decisions. So it's really looking for those where we're trying to see if there's anything that uh, where you're not able to make decisions. So this document does not have to be executed with an attorney, but if there is questionable things like that, if you do know you have a loved one who's, you know, they have early, they're in the early stages of dementia, they have, they wax and wane, they do better in the morning than the afternoon, right? That's something where you probably want to bring an attorney in just to make that absolute uh, determination. Also true is that, uh, you know, medical capacity is different from legal capacity. So we, we have clients that are in the hospital, they have medical capacity, but that doesn't mean they have legal. So it's up to the attorney to decide whether that person has legal capacity for the power of attorney. But again, if there are no issues with capacity, right? You bring yourself down or bring whoever, they're like, yes, this is what I want. No issues with capacity. Just needed to have a notarize and witness. That's okay. You don't have to involve an attorney. But if you've got those other nuances that complicate it a bit or you're concerned, do have an attorney involved. You hate to have down the road where, uh, especially if you have a family that is not in agreement on a lot of things, right? And we don't wanna have that conflict later. I don't think mom agreed to that. I don't agree with that. I'm disputing this power of attorney, right? You wanna make sure it's a sound document. But that's why we have the notaries and the witnesses to say, this person was here. I saw them sign it, agree to it. And I, in my opinion, they had capacity. So that's why they really wanna make sure. Um, the statutory gift writer, you might have heard this before, may not have, but it was part of the power attorney. It was a separate thing that needed to be witnessed and executed uh, and was added to the power of attorney. Because basically what, and before, what we had was we had a power of attorney, you couldn't give, your agent couldn't give gifts every year beyond $500 from your estate. And I know you might be thinking, I don't give family money like beyond $500 every year, but when you become incapacitated, you know, the things that may come up, might come up are things like Medicaid benefits. If you've got a certain amount in your estate, maybe you wanted to gift that. So it wouldn't be included when they're determining what you qualify for, right? Or yeah, this, yeah, you would talk a little bit more in detail before, you know, all, uh, with an attorney, if you're thinking about things like that and Medicaid benefits and all of that, just to talk more in depth about it. But uh, that, and also with life insurance and annuities, anything like that that you want to change, if it's worth more than 500, you're, before your agent couldn't do it without the statutory gift writer. Now, with all that said, now they got rid of that. So now it's all included in the modifications of your power of attorney itself. If it's beyond $5,000 a year, then we had to add some specific language. But now the gifts can go to $5,000 without any specific uh, you know, uh, informate, you know, adding any more and without adding that statutory gift writer. So it does come into play something to think about uh, if you wanted to do even more than that, if you've got really, you know, some large retirement plans, life insurance that you would want to have somebody pay out or whatever, just something to think about. Um, and the last thing I want to say, which was really great what they've done now, is that the refusal for a power attorney, so when it is produced, so when your agent goes to the bank or goes to your landlord and says, I can pay for this, I've got the power attorney, and they say, we're not honoring it. 
And that sadly used to happen more often and they didn't really have to provide a reason. So now they do. So now those entities have to say, no, we're not provided. And in writing within 10 days have to specifically say why they're refusing this document. So that's a really powerful thing for principals and their agents. Uh, and before it was just kind of a thing where, you know, some banks may just have a policy where they just don't accept certain powers of attorney. Now they've got to really demonstrate why it's not yeah, acceptable. Uh, one of the main things, powers of attorney terminate at the death of the principal. So, you know, I hear the phone calls, you know, somebody's passed away, they did or did not have a will, but oh, I was an agent, does that mean anything? Not really. Once somebody passes away, the principal, whoever they named as an agent, doesn't have any bearing on what happens after they pass. So once that, you know, that's only for the principal's lifetime, it's not going to have an influence on handling their estate, their property or whatnot after they pass away. So that's powers of attorney in a nutshell. So uh, with that, I felt the need to also, you know, advance directives, talk to you a little bit more about that, uh, you know, beyond the powers of attorney. So what is an advanced directive? So that's written instruction for healthcare treatment. So not the financial, legal sort of thing, the, the healthcare treatment. A lot of you may already have a healthcare proxy, right? You had a, a procedure, your doctor had you do one, right? Uh, a lot of times it comes up, uh, a lot of uh, doctor's offices, hospitals usually want to uniformly have you fill out one if you haven't already. Uh, you could always make out a new one too. And it, once you do, you should always provide it to your general practitioner, um, you know, any doctors you regularly work with, just so they know any loved ones, just so they know as well. Uh, I will talk, I will talk a little about, about these two, but not too much, but the non-hospital order not to uh, resuscitate, that's a DNR you, got, you may have heard of, and medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, that's another thing that New York has. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Uh, what is advanced care planning for? Advanced care planning is for anyone over the age of 18. So anybody over the age of 18 should think about these things. If it's important that your family and loved ones uh, know what your wishes are if you are unable to all of a sudden not make health decisions for yourself, okay? And, uh, you know, healthcare proxies versus living will. So you may have heard about these two things and were wondering what the heck's the difference between the two, right? So healthcare proxy, a healthcare proxy allows you to name an agent to make healthcare decisions on your behalf only if you're unable to. So, you know, you're at the hospital, you're in a hospital bed, as long as you uh, have capacity, you're competent, able to make decisions, you decide what your next healthcare treatment is. But if you're unable to, you know, uh, so unfortunately you're in a coma, you're in, you're sleepy, the, you know, you have medications that you're not able to be a sound mind, um, then that agent is able to help make those decisions. Important document, again, and uh, it really is a consenting to medical treatment on your behalf, that agent that you name. So really important. Now, versus a living will is very specific to end of life wishes. So commonly individuals will indicate in this living will that if uh, they have an incurable or irreversible uh, condition, they do not want life sustaining treatment if that only means uh, to prolong the dying process. So sadly, somebody, the uh, person who is making the healthcare proxy is, or the living will is going to be passing away and any of this treatment is only gonna sustain that process. Uh, most living wills do not provide that no extraordinary so, you know, nothing, you know, be done uh, if I, if you were to be in that condition. Uh, however, you can, you can have it so that certain procedures are done, that you do want, uh, a, you know, um, CPR, uh, you know, a shot to get your heart started, things like that, but you don't want a feeding tube and to be said, you know, so you can make it as specific as you want, or you can just, in, in general, the general language around a lot of living wills includes that just that irreversible, incurable, any of that life sustaining thing. Um, just a little bit, I'll go a little bit more about both of those. So for the healthcare agent, what is the healthcare agent? Again, that's a person you're choosing to help make um, healthcare decisions. Uh, your behalf. So really you want to talk to your whoever you name, right? What's the healthcare proxy? That, that's the document that you name this person. You want to let that person know what your wishes are, right? Um, and you know, a lot of times you just assume that they do, right? But it is good to let them know exactly and then to put it in writing that this is the person that I trust. I let them know what I want to be done. 
here and you know I give them the power to do it through this proxy. Um, you know, anybody, everybody should think about it again, who's 18 years or older, and then like life events that happen, you want to think about it, right? Getting married, getting divorced, uh, going on a major trip even, you might want to think about updating your healthcare proxy, uh, whether it's positive or negative events in your life, it's something to think about. Uh, and for this document, doesn't need to be notarized, just witnessed by two people who are 18 and over that are not one of your agents that you're naming. So that's all that's required for that. And if you don't appoint a healthcare agent, it does get a little bit tricky, right? Uh, there is the uh, Family Healthcare Decisions Act. And this is all, the New York State Department of Health has all this information and provide a link there, but that's where this all comes from. Um, and basically, eventually your surrogate, the person who would be essentially an agent, will likely be named in the order of like a spouse, as long as you're not separated, because they figure if somebody who's separated from somebody may not know their best right. Uh, but, uh, you know, son or daughter who's 18 or older, a parent, brother, sister. So it carries down, but it's a lot more complicated, right? Because we got to go through this act. We got to go through courts to make that person, okay, they can be the healthcare proxy. Um, so it's best to just execute one instead and just have it. And just for the living will, again, it's a written statement of your specific health power wishes at the end of life. Um, there's no set living, no set form in New York, but there's set language. So if you do decide to do it, whoever you start to work with, uh, the New York State Department of Health, I think they actually do have a sample form out there. Um, pretty, like there are some different forms, but they all include the same information. Um, it basically it just has to show that clear and convincing evidence that a person's wishes are what they wish. Um, a lot of the uh, living wills have also a component about organ donation. So it can be kind of specific if you want an organs donated or not, or, you know, things like that. Uh, but another, just another document to think about in your advanced directive and your planning. Uh, the other two that I mentioned before, and I just wanted to give you information about it. I, you know, we don't help with this. These are only things to talk to your healthcare provider about. And these two things are things that uh, that would require a medical professional to sign off on. It's just to let you know what they are. So that DNR I was talking about, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of DNRs. Uh, you know, that basically says that this, you know, given my position right now, I don't want CPR, uh, you know, which includes mouth to mouth res uh, resuscitation, chest compressions, um, inserting that tube into your airway, intubating you, injection, ejecting, medication to restart your heart. Like you've decided given your medical condition right now, if something were to happen like that, you do not want this done. And the medical order, the most, the medical order uh, for life-sustaining treatment for, that's very specific. Again, something you want to talk to your healthcare pro uh, provider about. And that's really something to consider and when you're in a really uh, terminal condition, sadly. Uh, you don't want to receive any uh, life-sustaining treatment. Uh, sometimes you reside in long-term care and, you know, and your death is within a year. It's very extreme. Uh, and it's something that you could talk to your health care provider a little more at length about. Um, not something I know a ton about. So that's something that, again, talk to your health care provider about. And just again, examples of DNR, which I think would be probably enough. The most is like extreme, like another uh, step, but the DNR, again, has a lot of these things. And, you know, again, if you, sadly, if you do suffer or know somebody who suffers from these serious conditions, sometimes they might want to think about it. Uh, you know, congestive heart failure, advanced stage cancer diagnosis, things like that. Uh, just to keep in mind. Uh, and yeah, and so if your medical professional doesn't bring it up themselves, you can and feel empowered to talk about those things. So that's that. So that's the advanced directives. Um, and let me just see how I'm doing on time. I'm talking away. Thank you for listening to me. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, um, again, I'm glad that uh, Jess will be sharing the PowerPoint with you. So hopefully you're not feeling stressed about taking a ton of notes. Um, let me go on to, okay, we talked about advanced care, all that. Oh, and again, those documents, everything, those, all that I just talked about, all end after you sadly pass away. So now let's go into a little bit of estate planning, your will, last will and testament. Also, I will be talking a little bit about trust, which doesn't necessarily mean after you've passed away, but um, there's some implications to it, but I'll get more into that. Uh, so last will and testament, also called a will, right? Okay. What? So a will is uh, a written statement 
about your wants with your property after you pass away. So uh, directions on how it's divided, you name an executor, that's the person who carries out your wishes. One thing is, just because somebody's named an executor doesn't mean they get to carry out things however they want to. They do it exactly how it's made in the will. I get folks that I get upset because their sibling was named the executor and they're like, well, they're just gonna leave, every, give everything to themselves and nothing to anybody. That's not how that works. An executor, whoever you name as executor, uh, also called executress, whoever it is, um, they are carrying out your wishes. So you really want somebody who you think would be willing to act in that, who has the availability, the energy to, it's not the easiest thing to carry out your wishes, right? To make sure that creditors, bills are paid off, to make sure if you wanted to leave things to your family, that they do, they get that, you know, stuff to whoever, right? So you really want to make sure it's somebody who really wants to act in that fashion. Some people, you know, you just know that they're not going to be able to, or they don't have care to. So don't, you know, really think about who you want to name as your executor. But again, they don't get to just decide what they want to do. They're there to carry out what your wishes are and what you had left in your will. So to be a valid will, uh, I won't go into depth about like executing it, but really it's got to be a writing and meet certain legal requirements. One of those requirements is being properly witnessed. So for anybody, if you're considering doing a will, I know there's online stuff. There's like, sometimes that could be perfectly um, uh enforceable. It just may be a hard uh, try to get an attorney to witness it. Most of attorneys were not going to witness something we didn't draft, uh, but you could get any witness as long witnesses, again, just as long as they're not named as a beneficiary in your will um, and they're of that mind and everything, they can witness your will. Um, so there's a couple other legal nuances, but it's something that you'll want to consult with an attorney with if you're going to create a will. Um, a will cannot be used at all by your executor or anybody named in it or your family until after you pass away and it's approved by a surrogate court judge and it's filed with the court and the judge says, yes, this is a valid will and then we can enforce it. Uh, and for, it can only, and what's really interesting here is in New York, the only the original will is enforceable. So I've got a copy of somebody's will and I want to file that. That's not enough, an original will. So that's why you might've heard of people are very like, I've got my will, it's, you know, I got a safekeeping in my drawer here. Or I've got it at the attorney's office or whatnot because the, it's the original will that you want. Now, granted, there are cases where, you know, we'll have to go over the copy because the original has disappeared, but it's very, very hard. You want to make sure that once you create a will, that it's in a place for safekeeping. So as I mentioned here in the PowerPoint, uh, many counties, including Onondaga County, you can file your will with the court so for safekeeping. I think that's the best option, right? $45 filing fee the last I knew. Keep it with the court. Tell your family, friends, I filed my will for safekeeping at the court, at the surrogates court, the probate court. That way, when you pass away, they know exactly where to find it, and it's in perfect condition, original will. That's the best way to do it. Some people, you know, again, a lawyer's office, usually pretty good, sadly, sometimes. Uh, original wills are kept, and it's a solo practitioner, and then they pass away, and that leads to some issues. Hopefully, that will can be located, but I, I do think the best option is the county. You can also just keep it yourself if you trust yourself, or you could do a, a you know a safety deposit box at the bank, something like that. But really want to make sure it's in a safe location and that uh, that your loved ones and friends know where to find it. Uh, wills are confidential documents until you pass away. So the diet till it's admitted to court and everything is it a public document. So even when you file it away at your attorney's office, at home or ever, it's in a sealed envelope. It's got just your name, address, and the date it was executed, and that's it. Nobody's allowed to see it or anything like that. You can't, no family pressure. Like, I want to see what your will says and everything. Nope, it's my private confidential document until I pass away, and then you can see it. But until then, it's mine. So we keep it and say what the, the courts don't want to see it. They'll take your little folder, they'll take the $45 fee, give you a receipt, and they'll tuck it away for safekeeping in their vaults. And that's all there is. 
So with that, I did want to mention trust, as I said, you know, so a trust is a contract. Basically, you can create all sorts of trust. Uh, just to set aside your assets in a trust. So uh, a trust, is, the assets are managed by who you call a trustee in the document. And trustee's job is to manage the assets, kind of like an executor manages the estate and to the benefit of the beneficiaries. Again, they're going to carry out the trust to benefit the people you name as beneficiaries. So uh, there are two main types of trusts, testamentary trusts and inter vivos trusts. So a testamentary trust, testamentary trust, kind of like last will and testament, testamentary trust. So that's an optional part of your will. So at the time of your death, you can instruct the executor through your will to establish a trust to control your assets beyond death. The drawback with this is if it's not, it doesn't work, there's no power to it until after you pass away and the will gets probated. Uh, again, so something you want to talk to your attorney about uh, if you want, if a trust is a good idea for your situation. Now, something that's not uh, involving a state or anything is the inter vivos living trust, otherwise known as. So that's something that you create in your lifetime. Um, it's separate apart from your will. Some of you might have created one before, might have one now. Uh, it functions similarly similar to the testamentary trust uh, but, and requires no court. So it doesn't have to be approved by the court or anything like that. Uh, the drawback is, is that it will only help control what assets are specifically named in that trust. Anything else will have to go through probate after you pass away. So that's the only kind of drawback to that. Again, there's something that you may want to consult with an attorney about uh, if you think that it makes sense to develop a trust. Um, living trusts that I did mention here, they, there are two main types. There's a revocable living trust and irrevocable living trust or irrevocable trust. And uh, basically the revocable, that's what you hear about in estate planning. Basically allows you to, allows management of your affairs during your lifetime. So you take care of everything during my lifetime, but then if you become disabled, that trustee can help carry out that, your financial affairs. And this doesn't require, and without you having a power attorney or any sort of court intervention. So just another thing to keep in mind, again, you'll want to consult more with an attorney if you don't know too much about this area to really see what works for you in your situation. It's just an option out there. Uh, the interview, the uh, irrevocable trust, uh, those are to place assets outside your reach. So this is really specific. Um, and doing so, it's so creditors can't go after certain assets. Uh, or access certain funds, uh, taxes can be avoided or delayed through using these. Uh, it may allow you to get uh, Medicaid benefits that you, you know, because of the loss of the assets. So very specific. Uh, they're designed so that you don't own, that you don't longer own those assets really to, and uh, without significant legal action. But that's very specific. Again, something you'll really want to talk through and think about with, uh, with an attorney to see if that's something that would work for you. But it does come up, right? With Medicaid benefits and all of that, we kind of have to play this juggling game of figuring out what's best to do with our assets so that everything is kind of taken care of, right? So just another thing that I wanted to give you guys a heads up about that is something out there. Uh, with all these things, there's other, there's other trusts out there. There's things called pool trusts that help with, um, you know, uh, getting certain benefits other ways. So uh, there's also other documents out there. There's sometimes you could create a last wishes document that has like my five, you know, it comes down to really urgent circumstances. These are my five wishes I hope to get done. It's, you know, it's notarized, it's consulted with an attorney about all kinds of documents you could have. But these are the really the big ones, especially the ones I talked about at first, powers of attorney, healthcare proxy, living will maybe, and your last will and testament. You know, for us, we serve uh, people with limited uh, assets and low income, and those are the four documents that we create for everybody. No matter how simple their estate is, that's the four things that we think are really important. Um, so that's that in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> lots of good stuff there. Um, I'll go ahead and just keep, if it's okay, I'll just keep going with, I know that we had mentioned just starting the conversation. So this is a lot. 
for anybody to kind of talk to about you thinking about starting even within yourself like I start thinking about these or you've got somebody in mind that you want to have this talk with right how do we get this started so these are a bunch of things I could actually there's a lot of information they're all kind of the same this one was America AmeriCare uh, a website that has these a lot of other places you know say the same things uh, yeah you can check that out for tips uh, I didn't put all the details about each one down, but uh, let me just go through it really quickly. You know, the start early, sadly, time and time again, it's, you know, loved one, I get a call in the hospital already or has developed dementia to the point where they can't make decisions, right? So there's no power attorney can be done. No healthcare, but none of that can be done if you don't have capacity, right? So you don't want to wait till that happens. Uh, so start early, start, you know, start thinking about it because uh, it does get really tricky. Um, folks think, you know, oh, right, well, if they're not able to make a power attorney, then what's the easier, what can I do? The next step is usually guardianship. And that's really a long process. It's a really a lot. A lot of times it's a matter of a Supreme Court filing. It's not something there's like really any pro bono help out if you're low income. So really, really want to think about planning ahead on that. So starting early, uh, when you're talking to somebody else or even thinking of yourself, exercise patience. You just absorbed all this information. So if you go to somebody and say, no, we got to do this right now. We got to, it's like, whoa, I got to think about this, right? I got to think about who do I want to make my agent? I got to think about what I want to leave. You know, these are not quick decisions. So when you're speaking to somebody or else or even yourself, be patient, you'll get through it. It's, you know, there's a lot of information to go through and think about. But, you know, take, it's okay. You know, you're starting when you're all ready to go. You're starting here with getting this information. Uh, so it's okay. And same for if you're trying to have this conversation with somebody else. Uh, again, do your homework, what you're doing here right now. Do your homework, see what's out there, see what information's there, resources, things like that. Uh, if you have uh, siblings or close family and you're dealing with a parent, a brother, a spouse, a child, that needs, you think you really could benefit from doing this, uh, you know, it helps to have some backup. You know, it's a hard thing, you know, uh, but converse with empathy, you know, really, you know, we're all in this position. Like I said, 18 or older, you should be thinking about these things. So we all should be. So, you know, I, I even my late father didn't want to hear about wills. And then, and then, and it's like, we're all going to pass away. We all got to figure it out. Don't we want to, you know, and some people don't like to talk about it, but we all need to talk about it. We all need to think about these things, but just being empathetic and listening, you know, and, uh, it, you know, and really try to figure out, well, what are you worried about? Okay, well, this is how we can make it better. If you're worried about that, we can put it down in here. We can make sure it's all set, right? Um, I'm worried about, you know, the kids arguing over this or that. Well, let's put it down. Let's make it so they don't, they can't argue over it. It's done and they're your wishes and they don't have to know about it until after you pass away. So there you go. So they, they won't be mad at you. So we'll just get it all done and figure it out. Um, you know, and avoid pressure, you know, like they have a lot of examples that always happens when you have a conversation about somebody who, you know, maybe shouldn't be driving anymore, maybe shouldn't be doing certain things. Don't do it while they're driving. Oh, I don't think you should be driving. I don't think that's it. You know, do it. Avoid the pressure. Don't do it. You know, they're about to go into surgery. Let's like do, you know, like let's have it when we're home in a calm environment, not amongst a bunch of people in front of people I don't know really well, or like my sister who I don't get along with. Like, let's just have a nice, quiet, private conversation about what you want to do. Uh, get help, you know, go, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, Office for the Aging locally is great. I'll bring that up a little bit later. Things like that. There's a lot of great groups for support. There's a lot of caregivers. If you're caring for somebody, you need to have these conversations. Lots of support out there. And keep notes. You forget all the time. It's like, wait, who did I say? Did I want to name that person or that person? Did I mention this person? You know, what was it that I wanted? You know, keep notes as you discuss these things, as you think about them, or as you are working with somebody else to think about it. So those are just your general tips and talking with your even internally with yourself, what you should be thinking about, or when you're talking to somebody else to really think about these things. And uh, I'm just gonna mention that when I said, you know, these other organizations, uh, we had, um, and I talked to Jess about this, an elder law fair that we do, and uh, we had a virtual one. 
And there's a link here that it will be in your PowerPoint, but you're welcome to go to the website. Again, they're all recorded videos of our present uh, presenters. They have the PowerPoints, the resources they shared, links to that. We had some great stuff. If you guys have any, uh, want to learn more about senior scams and fraud, uh, renter's rights if you're renting or reasonable accommodations, uh, caregiver support and resources, great one. We also had another one on estate planning. So it went a little bit even more in depth than what I'm talking about, about your estate planning. So those are all on our website too. So you guys are welcome to go to that. Welcome to watch any of those videos. They're always available. I don't think we'll take it down anytime soon. It'll be up there for a long time. So that's it. I think that's all the information I had. So if anybody has any questions, I'm ready to field them. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. That was so much information. So oh, much good information. I know. It's a lot to absorb. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> Well, you know, it's such a benefit, right? I mean, because I, uh, some folks here may have heard me talk about it, but I teach college too. So, you know, like sometimes you just really bombard them with the information and then trust, right. <laughs> you know, right. that everyone's going to do their homework and due diligence. But thank you so much for their generosity and for all of this legal information. Um, it's helpful for me too, you know, like even as a younger person who also, you know, needs to start thinking about these things. Right. So. Right, right, so thank right. you for that. Um, if anybody does have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and I can read them out loud for uh, Sam and for anyone that may be listening. So go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, but to get the conversation started, I had a question, um, sure. which was so I wanted to know if there were like any relationships where these like documents or relationships might be assumed or automatic. So like with a spouse or a parent or something like that, you offered examples of needing like a, a power of attorney for adult children. But I was just curious if there were any situations where like you don't need one of these documents because there's an assumption of um, power of attorney or healthcare proxy or something like that. Right, right. A lot of times, yeah, there are some some situations, absolutely, you know, in a hospital setting, um, in a bank situation, a lot of different settings where a lot of times the spouse, especially, there are some legal uh, rights that come with that. Um, it just, it really depends on what entity you're working with. So uh, with a bank, sometimes we just don't think about it. It's like, oh, we have a joint account. That's why it's not an issue. Oh, we're both, you know, it's not an issue. But then all of a sudden, spouse is not as you know incapacitated for some reason in the hospital and now i need to talk to medicaid about their situation well medicaid might say no unless you have a power attorney even though you're a spouse it's not enough so it just depends on the circumstances just i you know it really um, i don't know exactly i don't have a, that's a good question a good list of like when it's like okay i'm the spouse and i'm good like that's it i'm done um what i will say is it's surprising when it's not so like I had, for example, I've had somebody who was, uh, you know, a mother who had uh, a son who was pretty much disabled, incapacitated, and uh, care for his whole life. And then he went into the hospital. Uh, there were certain treatments she didn't want him to have, uh, but he was 18. He had just turned 18 and the hospital's like, no more. And she's like, wait, I always tell you what we like to do. And they're like, yeah, but he's 18 now. So now you don't have that decision-making power. Now, in certain circumstances, if they have a disability, that's a little bit different. That's a, uh, a guardianship, but same sort of thing with a power of attorney. You know, unless that person has named them that agent, then they have no right to discuss just because it's your, that happens a lot just because they're your son or daughter. If they're 18 or over, uh, many things are not gonna talk to you. Many entities are gonna be like, unless you've got a power of attorney, so really the only time you really kind of have that automatic is usually a spouse for a lot of cases. But that is, again, not always the case without an agent. Yeah, without the power of attorney. And I have just like a follow-up question on that too, um, around like could be a spouse. Like what happens if let's say you're like getting separated from or divorced from a spouse or have a child that like doesn't want to, you know, fulfill that role? Um, yeah. What happens? <laughs> So uh, you have uh, a power of attorney and they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Like a power of attorney. Like, let's say they just, that they don't want to hold up their end of the deal because you're in the process of separation and just like never got around to changing yeah, it or yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> something like right, that. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's really, it's hard. So basically with that, a, a power of attorney is this paper that is, is this directive that is like, I get to talk on their behalf because I'm named as the power of attorney here and there. If, if, they don't act and they don't produce that. 
power attorney, right? They're not saying they don't, they just don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. And unfortunately, if they don't want to do it and there's no alternate or succession or a successor agent, then there's it's essentially there's no power of attorney, right? Because they're mm-hmm. not willing to act as a power of attorney. If you've got somebody who can uh dispute that be hopefully name the power attorney it's a court process so yeah it's tough uh that's why you may want to think about having for sure an alternate if you can Mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't want to act right uh that can on your behalf um if like i said for those documents something to think about changing when you have a life-changing event so if you get separated right I should change that document, right? Uh, Same with your healthcare proxy. I don't want my separated spouse to be the one making my decisions, right? Or I don't want my estranged child to be the one, right? So keeping that updated. But really, there's not, they're not forced to act. They're using that so they can get access to that. Does that mm. make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And it's a, a good reminder to stay on top of your legal documents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, a lot of times stay with the wills, right? I've had a lot of changes in family, right? Uh, and I wanted to change my will. And they did, so something to think about. All these documents every few years, at least. And then with all, and anytime you have a life changing event. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, We got a question in from one of our audience members who wanted to know around um, how much does a trust cost on average? Oh, I really couldn't say. It really depends. It depends on how uh, complicated the trust is. It depends on who you work with. So I will be quite frank. Some firms, some attorneys cost more than others. So some have a retainer for a certain amount, and then they have their hourly cost to that is depending on their uh, expertise and everything that hourly cost might be more. So it really depends on who you're working with. And like I said, there's even some, if you can't afford it, turn your low income, which most of the, in the area is about 200% or less of the poverty guidelines. So that means that basically you have an income of for one person, 2,100 or less a month. If you make more than that, then you probably don't qualify for that. So you would have to go to a private practitioner. Um, I could include this, I could send you this information, Jess, but there is, a, the Onondaga County Bar Association has a, a lawyer referral service. And what it is, is they have a list of attorneys that specialize in different areas and they know which areas and all those attorneys are willing to give a free consultation. So they're willing to speak with you, see what's going on in your situation, then they'll tell you uh, what their fees are and then you can decide if you want to move forward with them. And you could try a couple of consult with many different attorneys just because you consult it with one doesn't mean you have to go with them. Go with somebody that you really feel confident in that understands what you want. Um, and I will say the more complicated your situation, you really want to think about having somebody that has real to make you a really good sound product, make you a really good sound will and everything like that. Uh, you know, and I feel, uh, you know, I'd like to say that most practitioners always, uh, if they say they can do it, they can do it, but you want to be, you know, aware of everything. But yeah, I wish I knew a general amount, but I really don't know. For that trip. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that resource, though. It's so good to know about the Onondaga County Referral yeah, Service. Yeah, it's a really great organization. The Bar Association is a super active one in Onondaga County, which is fantastic. So uh, most of your area attorneys, a lot of attorneys identify as the states of trust attorneys. They will be capable of creating you a sound will, a sound will and, t- and trust if wanted. Yeah. I'm just taking some notes so I can (laughs) have them for my records. Um, Thank you so much for that. We have another question, um, which is if you can't get someone to act as a power of attorney, could you assign an attorney to take that role on for you? You know, you actually can. I actually know of some attorneys who have taken that role. So you absolutely could. You just would have to get the attorney to agree to it. Um, and I have many attorneys do, and many attorneys are also when I said that trustee to carry out your trust, a lot of attorneys are as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, I've got an adult child who is, I just don't trust him to manage the finances. If I leave them, it's my right. It's just, I want it to be a little bit controlled. So I'm going to name, I, I, I'm going to have the attorney be the trustee. So the attorney is going to keep documents, keep, you know, uh, a record, financial records, and they're going to disperse the money as as I defined in my trust to the beneficiary. Uh, so oftentimes it is. A lot of times uh, an attorney will be the power of attorney. And uh, we've had that for even just limited where somebody just really, really needs help and they just don't have, you know, they just don't have anybody else to do it. So, yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you. That's good to know. That's a good question. Very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? Well, if not, Sam, I'd love to invite you to, well, one, I'd love to thank everyone for joining us here tonight yeah. and for um, witnessing and listening with such attention. It really is a gift to be able to uh, be with you all in this virtual space, in this virtual educational space, and also to extend great gratitude to Sam, who offered her time and her expertise to educate us tonight. Um, and so in closing, Sam, I would love to invite you to leave us with any closing words. Oh, great. Well, firstly, just thank you to you all. I so appreciate the cameras being on and everything. I tell you, this virtual world where you're just staring at a bunch of names is not fun. So I appreciate you and kind of trying to engage with me as best as possible. Again, I know this is a lot of information. Uh, take your time with it. Do uh, in the PowerPoint that you'll get after this, do you see my information on the last slide? Feel free to reach out, happy to uh, get you connected with other resources. And again, really check out that our website too with those other links, I, really good information out there. I really think it's important to think about, uh, you know, all of that caregiving is really tough. Think about the resources that are out there. Scams and fraud are affecting all of us in this digital world, especially another good thing to keep in mind. So lots of really good information there. Lots of more better experts than I to talk a little bit more detail about estate planning. So all that, please do check out. And uh, I do really appreciate you. You're doing such a good job already, already looking into this, learning information about it. So that's a step in the right direction. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, we've got people typing in. Thank you. Very helpful. Oh, very informative. Absolutely. Um, this was a great group. Great questions too. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night and we'll see you next month.